For a long time, it was believed that the human brain was fixed or hardwired, and most forms of brain damage were therefore permanent and irreversible. However, scientists have since come to realize that far from being fixed, the brain has remarkable powers to regenerate itself, even in old age. Norman Doidge is a psychiatrist and medical researcher. In his new book, he explores the impact of this revolutionary discovery on all of us. It's called The Brain That Changes Itself, stories of personal triumph from the frontiers of brain science. For years, we've been told that the human brain is like a machine, a computer, that there are different parts, that they're responsible for different functions, and if those parts break or wear down or are damaged, we lose that function. Now, in your new book, you throw this all on its head, and you say that, in fact, the brain is plastic. Right. Explain what, what, what that means. Well, plastic means plastic in the sense of plasticine, um, modifiable, adaptable. The plastic brain is a brain that can change its structure and its function depending both. on... Both. Both. Without, without drugs or invasive... Without strength. drugs, just depending on what you do with your brain. Uh, the task at hand that you are working on, uh, what you're perceiving can cause you to change the structure of your brain uh, on many levels. Um, and what you, and this is the most fantastic part, what you think and imagine actually can change the structure of your brain uh, down to the very connections between the brain cells, down into the genes even. For instance, you know, one, one of the most uh, you know, staggeringly interesting discoveries of the late 20th century was the discovery that learning changes the number of connections between the neurons, uh, the nerve cells, uh, in a nervous system. You can go, for instance, from having perhaps 1,300 uh, connections between nerve cell A and nerve cell B to 2,700 uh, in, with several hours of training. Simply by, by virtue of more brain activity occurring. By virtue of learning and brain activity. So what, what happens is uh, thoughts or activities that you do with your brain actually turn certain genes on and others off inside the nerve cells, which then make proteins, which then change the structure. Now, why is this discovery considered so revolutionary? And more particularly, what are the implications of this discovery for people with brain dysfunction? A stroke, for example. When you had a stroke, the general assumption was your brain got swollen, the chemicals were kind of deranged, and after a few weeks, whatever you were left with was what you would have to live with for the rest of your life. You basically lost that brain function yeah, that the, was damaged. The, the, the cells died, they couldn't be replaced the healthy ones around it couldn't reorganize and so um, we were kind of waiting for the swelling to go away and rehab was just sort of focused on getting you over that period. Now we know that rehab can actually re reorganize the brain if it's done properly and bring many new functions back. But if I could just say it, it also meant uh, that as you started to get older and your, your brain started to decline, uh, it was like a machine that was wearing out and the attempt to exercise your brain uh, in the second half of life was really kind of unwarranted or a waste of time. And so we, we just ex accepted an, a view of human development in which the second half of life is a period of, of mental, necessary sure. mental decline. And then, of course, the whole view of human nature that we have. We see, you know, since the rise of modern science, most educated people see human nature in some way is emerging from the human brain. And if the human brain was fixed, immutable, and a rigid structure, it made a lot of sense to think of human nature as fundamentally fixed. Uh, and so we have to re-examine all that, and I, I begin to do that in this, in this book. Well, and you do it by way of story, and that there's some remarkable, uh, almost logic-defying remarkable, yes. given what our traditional notion of what the brain is. Uh, probably the, the most remarkable in it is the story of a woman who was born with half a brain. Yeah. Tell me about Michelle. I went to visit Michelle because I thought that, um, I, I knew that she did have, ha was born with uh, one, one hemisphere alone, just half a brain, and I thought that whatever changes that she was able to undergo would really test this notion of, of plasticity, certainly at least in early life. And um, basically, when she was in the womb, some ca catastrophic event occurred, so uh, her left hemisphere never developed. And based on what, uh, you know, the, the usual view of that the brain basically has certain areas which in the left hemisphere which are responsible for speech and other functions, right. uh, someone with that level of damage, you would imagine, would be unable to speak, unable to think. They might be alive but on a respirator. 
And it turns out that that's not the case with Michelle. Uh, in fact, um, if you met Michelle, you, you would de de detect some subtle things, like one of her arms is a little twisted, etc., and um, her speech when she's upset, so it's a little repetitive. But you would never dream, and nor did the people who examined her for a number of years dream that she had half a brain. Well, explain to this now. If, if we had thought that, okay, this part of the brain is responsible for speech, and I don't have this part of the brain, how is Michelle speaking? We know that there's a lot of plasticity early in life. I, but we also know, and I make this very clear in the book, there's plasticity from cradle to grave. But, you know, there are waves of increased plasticity. And it turns out that what the brain does is it learns how to do what it's got to do at the time. So um, parts of the brain that might have been devoted to other things will learn how to move. If it has to see to survive, they'll be devoted to vision. And so uh, all these things can actually reorganize and move around. My, to, these higher mental functions. To give our viewers even more kind of appreciation of the extent to which that, that, that's possible, uh, retell the story that's in the book that you dub the woman who was perpetually fallen. Cheryl Schultz uh, was a woman, she had a hysterectomy and she was given a medication because she developed an infection called gentamicin. And it poisoned the vestibular apparatus, which is the balance apparatus in her brain. Right. And if you lose your sense of balance, you will feel like you're perpetually falling. When I was with Cheryl at one point, I asked her, what's it like when you've fallen, finally fallen to the floor? What do you feel at that point? And then she says, sometimes I just feel the floor opens up and I fall into a perpetual abyss. Yeah. So that was her life, and she ended up on disability. And one of the great uh, people who were at the cutting edge, I call these people neuroplasticians, to coin a phrase, Paul Bachirita, invented a mechanism and I was there when she was using the mechanism for one of the first times that basically was attached to an accelerometer. An accelerometer is like a gyroscope. And um, she would, uh, the accelerometer would be in a hat on her head. Like a construction hat. Like a construction yeah. hat. And it would give signals that went into her tongue of all places, telling her where she was in space. I tried it on. So when you lean forward, and you feel like champagne bubbles, they're really little electric shocks, tell you you're forward. You lean back, it goes back. And she would put this hat on, and immediately, um, she would, normally she'd be holding herself like up on a table lest she fall. And immediately, she, her whole body relaxed. And this seemed like a miracle. Why? Because the sensory apparatus, uh, the, the, the sense of touch on the tongue goes to a, a different part of the brain than the balance apparatus. So somehow or other, these signals coming in were making new pathways or strengthening very dormant pathways between her, her sense of touch and her sense of balance. So that was the first miracle. I, I saw that happening. and She had tried it on. And, but the, the, then there was a second miracle, which is as she started to use the machine more, she found she had a residual period where she would take the hat off. And at first, the residual period lasted 30 residual seconds. Residual period being that she still had balance. It had She's, the same exactly. effect, even though the hat was That's off right. now, right? It lasted for you know, a few seconds. And then it lasted longer and longer. And as she started to use the, the hat and take it home and use it, she would be going for days. And that was the, a true miracle, because what was happening to the miracle? I mean, it's only a miracle if you think that the brain is, fi is right, fixed. Right, right, right. It's actually not a miracle. Uh, because she now no longer considers herself a wobbler. Because so, the brain reordered itself it and put the balance in a different part of yeah, the brain it, that wasn't damaged. Yeah, and it, it developed new paths. Now, is this sensory substitution? I mean, this is, again, another fascinating notion you introduced this is in, right. in the this book. Is, this is what uh, Paul Bachirita called sensory substitution. He did, uh, he did this as well for for people who had been congenitally blind. They'd never seen anything. Um, and he rigged up a camera to a computer and then attached it. Originally, was to the back. And there were vibrating pixels that were on the back. And then he, he put it in through the tongue. And he found that he could train a, a human tongue uh, to function like a retina. And they would be able to see Twiggy. They would say, well, that's a picture of Twiggy. That's a picture of a vase. That, that's, you've just moved a vase in front of a telephone. They could, could read certain things. Um, if you threw a ball at them, they would duck. They could see perspective. I mean, so this is a remarkable example. They could example. see through their tongue? 
what was happening is the tongue is like a two-dimensional surface, just as the retina, the retina is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, basically, uh, that the images would be the images would be on, on the, the tongue. And then we've recently learned, actually, this was uh, some work also done in, in Canada. Baki Reed is fr was from the states, that the the input coming into the tongue was processed in the back of the brain, which we tend to call the visual cortex. Hmm. So it was all being rerouted, and uh, Paul Bakke Reed has found different ways to do sensory substitution, which is lay, lay the groundwork for the notion of a retinal implant, but also other, you know, helping other people who've lost their, lost, literally lost the ability to sense certain things. We, we uh, touched on the whole uh, issue of stroke victims, uh, and that you can tell a great story here about a surgeon in his mid-50s had a terribly re uh, debilitating stroke. Tell me how he came back. Michael Bernstein, uh, yeah, was uh, out. He was playing tennis. He was a tennis. He spent the morning doing uh, surgery on the eyes, so he needs a lot of fine motor skills. It's microscopic surgery, if you, uh, or it's, it's in a small, confined space. Then he was playing tennis. Then he developed a stroke, and he couldn't move one side of his body. He went for conventional rehabilitation. They gave him whatever it was, the four to six weeks. And then he's basically they said, you're on your own. And he had very, very little control of, of his arm at that point and very little control of his leg. And then he tried a new form of treatment. He happened to be from Birmingham, Alabama, where a man named Edward Taub uh, had developed this new treatment called constraint-induced therapy. And one of the things the neuroplasticians have shown in hundreds of experiments now is that it's a use-it-or-lose-it brain. Uh, if you don't lose, if you don't use something, it's ta that cortical real estate is taken over mm. by something else. Now, what happens when many the com a very common form of stroke is you have a stroke in the left hemisphere and you can't move your right 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 hand. You're and, paralyzed. Yeah, and that side. you can't move it well, etc. And so people try to use their arms, it doesn't work, and so they stop using them. Now, what Taub did ingeniously was. He got people to put their good hands in slings. Constrain them. He constrained them. And then he, if a person could just do this, he would give them small amounts just to get a little more control over that, very incremental. And he worked them very, very hard. And they would have to do things like, you know, try to wash pots. And, you know, people would come in, they couldn't dress themselves, they, could, they, they couldn't eat, they couldn't put food on a fork. They literally would have been dependent for the rest of their lives. And Michael Bernstein was one of the first to go through this, and after two weeks of very intensive training, and that's not a long time. Okay? No, no, it isn't. Uh, he was able to function, get back to work, and function as a surgeon. And there are people who went to the Taub Clinic who, uh, there was one person uh, I spoke to who had had his stroke fif almost 50 years before. He had been a little boy playing baseball when he had his stroke. He was able, they, they could help him all these years after the fact. I mean. That's just so remarkable because that plasticity and the ability to reorganize is, is in the brain. And it's, it's even helped people who've had traumatic injuries, of traumatic brain injuries. I think that that's the kind of thing that would be very helpful for anyone who's got those kind, well, not anyone, but many people with, uh, with traumatic brain injuries. For instance, think of the soldiers is, coming back from Afghanistan. Is this kind of therapy, or are these kind of treatments now finding their way into, into medical practice? Not because, quite. No, because normally when someone has a stroke or any kind of brain damage, I mean, we really do look on it very, very fatalistically, and that the evidence is what we should. They don't improve. Yeah. Look, we look on it fatalistically in part because studies that have been done in the past on people with brain damage and strokes showed that interventions didn't work. But now that the neuroplasticians have laid out the laws of this new science, um, there's, there's reason to be hopeful for a number of kinds of, of brain injuries. I bet, I bet. The notion of phantom pain, uh, again, documented that people who lose limbs, it's, they continue to, to hurt. Uh, you, again, claim that, that neuroplasticity both explains this and that researchers using the theories of neuroplasticity have been able to cure phantom pain. Tell right. me about that. Well, phantom pain was one of uh, the great mysteries of, of medicine. Mm -hmm. How is it possible to feel pain in a limb that isn't there? And what uh, a neurologist named Ramachandran discovered was that in patients who've lost their arms and then get pain, or in one case, unscratchable itches, what happens is if you remove an arm, there's cortical real estate, if you will, that had been devoted to moving that arm and feeling for that arm. It's now dormant. In the brain. Cortical in the brain. Yes. Yeah. So adjacent cortical real estate takes it over. And in the in the typical human 
body map, an area that's very close to the arm is actually the face. And we now know that phantom pain is often caused because the, the face maps in the brain uh, say, hey, there's more cortical real estate for us, and they start to move in there and uh, reorganize the brain. There was one patient he had who had an unscratchable itch, mm -hmm. so that was a terrible affliction for him. And Ramachandran eventually figured that if he just scratched the man's cheek, the itch went away. And Ramachandran was able, by the way, to sort of trick the brain into rewiring itself uh, using, using this same neuroplasticity. Uh, one of the reasons that people would have these frozen pains is because once the input is stopped into the brain from, you know, from the arm, uh, it's as though that's the picture that remains in the brain. There's no new, there's no new input to say now the arm is, is moving again. Many people who had phantoms felt their arms were frozen and in pain. So he set up a mirror device where you would look at what your real arm, mm -hmm. let's say this arm had been cut off, right. you'd look at your real arm and then you'd look into a mirror right here. The brain would be tricking you, thinking that your arm was And you'd think that your left arm was moving, that, which of course didn't exist. You'd kind of put your stump near it. And that rewired the map so that the, the frozen phantom could move. Now I understand that neuroplasticity also tells us something about the nature of sexual attraction and love. What's yeah. that? There's tremendous variation, of course, in what people are turned on mm -hmm, by, let's mm -hmm. say, sexually. I mean, you know, take situa situations in other cultures uh, s seem unnatural sometimes, and we, we learn that people can develop attractions. If you think of the whole idea that Chinese men a hundred years ago in the aristocracy were totally turned on by women who had their feet broken and bound right, up. Bound, yeah. Okay. We start to realize that sexual tastes can be acquired and we can, we can acquire sexual types. And we're seeing a lot of this happening now actually with, with the internet and internet porn in a way. You know, there are a lot of stories that started to um, uh, become public in, in the 90s about men who would get on the internet and they'd sort of just uh, be searching around and then they'd fasten onto certain images that would really turn them on, that really surprise them. And then they would practice them over and over and over again and they would have orgasms and when a person has an orgasm they secrete a, chem a brain chemical called dopamine which actually reinforces the circuit and rewards them. So dopamine is a, a neurotransmitter or a brain chemical that's very involved in consolidating a new circuit and these men would start to develop new sexual attractions that at times seemed bizarre to them. Hmm. Sometimes they dipped into childhood things. I mean one story I talk about in the book is a man who developed an attraction to spanking sites and if you think about it spanking would seem to have to do with early childhood but the other thing that was happening for these men and this was reported over and over and I saw it in clinical practice is they said that for a mysterious reason they were losing interest in their own partners even though objectively they found them to be attractive so here was a case where plas because of plasticity people were inadvertently rewiring their their brains um, and plasticity isn't always a good thing. Um, that it can lead to rigid behaviors and yeah, obsessions. Yeah, and, and in this case it leads typically or very frequently to a kind of an addiction and if you think about it addictions are about plastic change in mm. the brain. Mm. There, are, there are certain people who if they have alcohol uh, they have a chemical uh, sequence that's fired in their brain and a, a chemical called Delta Foss B is released that changes their brain uh, permanently. That's why sometimes it does make sense for a person to say, even though they haven't had a drink for years, I'm an alcoholic. It's in plasticity terms, my brain has been structurally altered by my interactions with alcohol. Now, interesting you say that because they also point out that psychoanalysis can be used to open up the brain's pathways and reorder uh, the, the, the brain's function too. I think you call this uh, neuroplastic therapy. Yeah. Uh, tell, explain to me what that what that is and how it would work. It turns out, from what I you know, based on what I told you before about you know thoughts altering genetic genetic behavior, that thoughts in therapy are actually changing brain structure as well. They change different brain structures, but the ma the major therapists that, that we know that are successful, uh, and that includes psychoanalytic therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies, something called interpersonal therapy. They're all for slightly different conditions. All rewire the brain, all change the balance in the brain's department. So 
uh, they are as every bit as biological, if you will, an intervention as the use of drugs. And the, the advantage of psychotherapies, if, if you don't absolutely need drugs, and I want to say, I mean, I use drugs sometimes, but the advantage of them is uh, they, they don't have as many side effects in general. And if you think about it, drugs as, as they are today are very blunt instruments. You take a pill and it goes and it bathes every cell in your brain and, in fact, in your body. And that's why we get so many side effects. And it would be, in, to a certain extent, if you're using thoughts for the intervention, you're like more like a microsurgeon going into the thought patterns that are problematic. Do we know enough about the brain to be that precise in terms of uh, psychiatry and, and psychoanalysis? In other words, if I make an interpretation right. about the meaning of a behavior, do I know where in the brain it's going? Well, if we're, if we're treating, let's say, an anxiety problem, right? We now know that uh, if, if you use psychoanalytic psychotherapy and you take a person before the therapy and you, you take the thing that's making them anxious and you make them think about it or attend to it, the part of the brain that's likely to light up and trigger the, 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 the sort of bolts of anxiety. And after they go through the therapy, if, if the therapy works, those parts of the brain aren't triggered. Now, you have an absolutely horrifying statistic here about our generation, the baby boomers, those between 40 and 60, that they have over a 50% chance of reaching the age of 85, and that 85-year-olds have a 47% chance of having Alzheimer's. We're going to have a population full well, yeah. of dementia. I mean, what can baby boomers do to enhance their brain power and ward off okay. that disease? Okay, so there's two things that we worry about when we think of mental decline as we get older. One of them is a, a more benign thing but, and more common. It's called age-related cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. The senior moments that begin in our 50s that uh, frighten people. And then there are the, the serious dementias. So the, the good news is that we know for a fact now that age-related cognitive decline is reversible through brain exercises. And I met with a man, Stanley Karansky, who was 90, who started to have some difficulties with senior moments, his handwriting was sloppy, he was no longer alert, he wasn't socializing much. And in six weeks, on a, roughly an hour a day, he was able to reverse all of that. What was he doing? He was doing a program called Posit Science that I describe in the book. Now this is a company, an actual company. Yeah. Tell me more about it, because you, they claim they can make 80-year-olds feel like 50-year-olds. Uh, well, they've shown it. Um, Posit Science was set up uh, by perhaps the world's leading neuroplastician, neuroplasticity researcher, Michael Merzenich. And he's already a man of great accomplishment. He had, in, was one of the inventors of the cochlear implant that allows the deaf to hear. He's helped kids with learning disabilities, um, uh, with reading disabilities, move from problems to basically normal or above normal levels. And they set up a program that rebuilds the auditory cortex, the part of the brain that processes language, from scratch in older people. What happens is that we age, one of the reasons that we cannot um, remember things is our brain maps for sounds are, are just kind of getting dulled. They need to be tuned up at the very basic level of distinguishing sounds like ba and da and pa. The reason is we, we haven't really used them intensively often, well, once we hit middle age, we are usually replaying mastered skills. Mm -hmm. But to maintain a brain in good shape, you've got to work as hard as you worked when you were learning a French vocabulary in high school. Maybe you didn't work at it, but as hard as you should have worked at sure. it. And so people go for decades without putting themselves through that intensive kind of training. And the cortex just kind of gets, gets dull, and you develop what are called fuzzy engrams. You don't hear the sound of the, of the person's name at the party crisply. So they rebuild it from the ground up. Now, how would our viewers get this program? Uh, go, pause it, P-O-S-I-T, science. Just go to put that in the internet and you'll come to the website for that. Uh, what do you think the next big breakthrough is in brain research? What's the next big thing we should be watching for? It's the translation of the fundamental laws of brain plasticity into applications for everything. Uh, in therapeutics, in all kinds of training, you know, that means sports, the military, education, um, anything you want to do and develop. Right now, um, basically, many of these disciplines have an intuitive grasp of some of the laws of plasticity, but the neuroplasticians can help sharpen and speed up learning. 
Um, so that's where I imagine it would come. I know that people will want to get very highfalutin and try to facilitate neuroplastic change with, with chemicals, and some of that might be doable, but that's also very problematic for the reason I said, that chemicals are still a very blunt instrument. At a personal level, I mean, that uh, th this book is full of very, uh, not just amazing, but uh, inspirational and uplifting stories. I mean, in the, over the course of doing the research, did it kind of change your sense of what human potential and perhaps yes, even human did. nature is? Yes, it did. Um, one of the most important insights I think I had while doing the book was what I call the plastic paradox, and that is this, that plasticity, uh, the brain is always plastic, but it can give rise to both flexible or rigid behaviors. Mm -hmm. It can give rise to rigid behaviors because once those networks are established, uh, they tend to outcompete the other one in a war of nerves that's going on inside our head. You know, the human brain is a habit-forming thing. So the way to understand plasticity is think of it as like a hill, uh, a snow on a hill in winter. And we, we get, we want to ski down that hill so we get to the top of it. And because the snow is plastic or pliable, we can take many paths down that hill but it being a hill, it has rocks and trees and will be inclined towards certain favorite paths. Now, as we keep using those paths, again, precisely because the snow is pliable and plastic, we'll develop tracks and ruts. And what we do in our lives and what, uh, is we tend to think that because we're stuck in a rut and repeating something, that not only is the behavior rigid, but the underlying brain is rigid. So when I'm working with patients, I try not to get fooled by the plastic paradox. Mm -hmm. And they're often fooled by the plastic paradox. And I would submit um, that all of humanity, to a large degree, has been fooled by the plastic paradox. I think we've underestimated how plastic our brains really are. Dr. Norman Deutsch, I want to thank you very much for joining me. It's been uh, fascinating and a real pleasure. Thank you.